Welcome, everybody. This is Pastor Dave Durandi from Grace Bible Fellowship here in North Middletown, New Jersey. I'm glad that you could join us. Uh, if you could pray with me. Father, be with us as we look into your word that you might sift through our hearts and help us to live and to be, to think and to feel like you. So, Lord, help us and guide us as we go through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've been going through the book of 1 John. We're in chapter 4. The first six verses of chapter 4 talks about the spirit of Antichrist and false prophets who were coming in to make a meal of the sheep or the people in the church. And now he's going to uh, exhort those who are in the church to be like Jesus, as opposed to being like those false prophets. So we're going to begin in verse 7. It says, Beloved... Let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And this is the love of God was manifested towards us, that God had sent his only son, begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit and we have seen and testify that the father has sent the son as savior of the world. So as we go into this next section, you will notice the word love used predominantly. In fact, here we see it 15 times in six verses. So uh, it almost becomes something where if you say it enough times, you almost forget the meaning of it. And so it's important for us to understand when he talks about love, what this love is. So as we look at it, my question is, what is love? If you look in the Webster's Dictionary, this is how it defines it. There's a profoundly tender, passionate affection for one person, for another person. A feeling of warm personal attachment or deep affection as for a parent, child, or friend, or it can mean sexual passion and desire. So this is what they define, uh, or the world defines, love to be. Now, of course, the scripture has a completely different thing. In fact, we grow up in this world and we get our definitions much from TV and from radio and from media and from our surroundings and our friends and our family. Uh, I don't know about you, but I grew up with a show called The Love Boat. And The Love Boat was The Love Boat. And everybody was trying to hook up with everybody else. And it was all about these, uh, these whirlwind romances where people meet each other and fall in love. And uh, sometimes it was good and sometimes it, it wasn't. But it was all taking place on a cruise ship. And, uh, you know, in 45 minutes, everything was over and, and uh, everybody lived happily ever after. What a, what a big difference. So there was another show called Love American Style. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, was also about stories of people meeting and falling in love and usually no substance whatsoever to their relationship, uh, just some kind of an affection, a physical attraction to one another. So that was Love American Style. Um, of course, we get definitions from TV today, like Dwight Schrute says, well, what is love? Uh, baby, don't hurt me. Like the song, <laughs> Baby Don't Hurt Me. But he said, false. It's a chemical imbalance in the brain. There are some people, uh, people who have been jaded and hurt, that believe that love is a chemical imbalance in the brain that is caused by doing uh, insane things, uh, giving yourself away. It's uh, actually a chemical reaction. Those people that view everything as biological. So there are some kids that were asked about what love is. One said, an emotional minefield. Apparently, they've been trained by those who have been through the minefield. And another is, what is love? It's a neurochemical con job. It's basically an illusion. It's something where it, it's like you get a fever. You get a, uh, something happens to you that misaligns your physique 
so you're not thinking straight and all of your other senses go out the window. It's the, it's the, the other sense that just takes over and makes everything else nonsense. So there are all of these definitions of what love really is. Dean Martin, uh, the, the, the prophet Dean Martin, gives us this explanation. Apparently it's a recipe. It involves a moon and an eye and a pizza. So when the moon hits your eye like a big pizza pie, that's amore. Uh, amore is, is love, unless you, you count amore eel. Um, but is that truly what love is? It's when the moon hits your eye like a big pizza pie. People actually dig this song and sing it. I, I hear it in Italian restaurants when I go. And that's not what love is at all. And yet that's someone's definition of love. If you look at some of the other, other artists like the Beatles. The Beatles had a song, you know, love, 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 you know, it's all about love, love is all you need, love is all you need, love is all you need. And if you say it enough times, people begin to sing it and they actually believe it's true. Until you hear the rest of the lyrics, which is, there's nothing you can do that can't be done, there's nothing you can sing that can't be sung, nothing you can say, but you can learn how to play the game, all you need is love, all you need is love. What in the world does that mean? It doesn't matter. But they're trying to explain what love is, and it has absolutely nothing to do with the lyrics that you see here on the screen. So when we open the Bible, and we open to 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 to 13, we get this whole definition of you know, love, love, love. We get 15 times in, in just several verses, and we don't know what love is because we've got all of this rattling around in our minds. We've got the, the voices of contemporary prophets uh, rat, rattling through our minds, and we don't know what love is. We, we think about Pat Benatar. She's great. We are young. Heartache to heartache we stand. No promises, no demands. Love is a battlefield. We are strong. No one can tell us we're wrong. Searching our hearts for so long, both of us knowing love is a battlefield. That is not love either. This is what the world tells us love is, because based upon their own surface experience of what love is, they sing out of their pain and, and quite often their anguish. Uh, you get somebody like Tina Turner, who says, what's love got to do with it? What's love got to do with it? Well, that's an interesting question. Oh, what has love got to do with it? Got to do with it, what's love but a secondhand emotion? A secondhand emotion. In other words, I, I've loved other people and I love you and I'll love somebody else. So it's a secondhand emotion. It just gets handed down from person to person. What's love got to do with it? Who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? So the words of the prophet is, the prophetess is, don't fall in love because you just get your heart broken and it's not worth it. Well, she's reflecting what she's been through and, and how she's experienced her life. You got people like the Jay Giles band who says love stinks. And so it goes until the day that you die, this thing they call love, it's gonna make you cry. I hate you. I've had the blues, the reds, the pinks, one thing's for sure, love stinks. And so these are the words that people hear over the years uh, of what love truly is. And it has absolutely nothing to do with what the scripture's talking about love is. So we have to kind of understand that the scripture has a definition for us of love that is far surpassed anything that you've heard here in this world or maybe even experienced with a human being. So uh, for a definition, a biblical definition, I think we go to Philippians chapter two, verses three and four. It says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you not only look to his own interests, but also the interests of others. So the scripture, without even using the word love, tells us this is what love looks like. This is what the behavior of loving one another looks like. It's when you prefer somebody else's needs and their concerns above your own, and your greatest fulfillment is the best outcome for someone else. It's a very different thing than anything that you'll hear, and it certainly has nothing to do with a physical relationship. It has everything to do with a mental commitment to do that which is right. And you can't fulfill it without the Spirit of God. You can't fulfill it without God doing a work in your heart, without the power that only God can supply, because it's a spiritual issue. So, an unselfish, loyal, and benevolent concern for an, uh, the good of another. So it's thinking about the good of another. 
and it's not thinking about yourself. It's the opposite of narcissism uh, or being selfish or self-centered. And most of the love that you hear talked about is very much self-centered. It's about how you feel about something or someone. There are five different Greek terms for love. Number one, eros. Eros is the physical, visceral desire that wants to be satisfied. That's what eros is. Eros is something that looks to be satisfied and is very self-centered. Much of what you see in contemporary culture talks about that. Number two is phileo, where we get the city of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. It literally means we are of the same womb. We're brothers. We're those who have come from the same place, made of the same stuff. It's that sort of give and take relationship that you have in phileo. And then the third one is agape. It is God's love for us. It is demonstrated in his giving of his only begotten son for our good. And so that is what agape is. It's the highest form of love. And then there's storge, which is a familial sort of love where a mother might have for a child or for a family member. And then there's xenon, which is a uh, love of a stranger, So uh, which you won't, you won't find those actually in the scriptures, but those are two other Greek words for it. So in looking through all this love, and, and we use this commonly too, you know, I, I love my car, I love my wife, I love my job. Uh, hopefully you don't have the same level of love for all of those things. You, you certainly don't love pizza like you love your wife, and you certainly don't love your job uh, like you love your dog. I mean, I'm, I'm sure those things don't intertwine. So we just use it so commonly in English, but in Greek, they're very, very uh, careful about how they use these tenses. This particular passage talks about agape. It's unconditional, a love that gives out of a multitude of supply. And so as we look at it, that is going to be our definition of what love is. He begins here, beloved, beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So the defining characteristic of a Christian is love above everything else, above all other things. In fact, it, you can see that here in Galatians chapter 5, where it's talking about the fruit of the Spirit. It's an interesting thing when you look at the syntax of it. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. By the way, that's singular. And then everything else after that describes that word, what that means. What does it mean that it is love, the fruit of love? The fruit of the Spirit is love. Which means, in parentheses, you could almost put joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So all of those characteristics are descriptive of what love is. So love is being patient. It's being kind. It's not being self-serving. It's not boasting. It's not full of itself. It doesn't become, it's not rude. Uh, all of those things that 1 Corinthians 13 talks about is what love is. So as we look at Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is love. It's the number one defining characteristic. So as I read the scripture and I look at it against my life, I start to think, am I a loving person? Do I treat people loving? Do I go out of my way? Am I sacrificial? Do I think of the needs of others above my own and not just think of my own needs, but also the needs of others? And I start to look through that and I begin to feel convicted that I'm not living up to what God's called me to do. And um, if you're honest, maybe you do too. I'm just not as loving as I should be, or certainly I'm not as loving as I've been loved. And I imagine the case is for you too. So there's a sense in which this fruit grows, and hopefully we're all growing in the fruit of love. It also says here in 1 Samuel 15, 22 to 23, I have to explain, give a backstory. Samuel, uh, the prophet, and Saul the king. Saul went ahead and did something he shouldn't have done and he basically didn't wait for Samuel to show up to do Samuel's job. He went and did Samuel's job for him. Instead of being obedient to what God said, he went and thought he was doing a good thing by making a sacrifice, which only the priest was to do. Samuel shows up just after this event, after Saul does these things he shouldn't have done, and he says this. So Samuel said to him, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. 
For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. This was the defining moment in King Saul's life where he is rejected by God because he overstepped. He tried to serve God, but he didn't do it in God's way. And he was disobedient, and he was stubborn, and he was self-willed about it. And so Samuel shows up, and he says, rebellion is witchcraft. Essentially, rebellion is witchcraft. I don't know about you, but I have been known to be stubborn. And instead of being calling myself what it is, which is sinful, you know, we use words like stubborn or pig-headed or I'm Italian or I'm, you know, just fill in the blank with any national uh, origin and say, well, that's why I'm this way, I inherited it, and that's, that's why I'm that way. But the thing is, it's a sin. It's like witchcraft, the scripture says, because it's an absolute rebellion against God. So, moving on to verse 9. In this, the love of God is manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us, and he sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. And so he begins to say we should love one another because love is from God. And, and if you love, that means you're from God. And if you don't love, it's because you're not from God. That's just the way it is. And then he says, we know what love looks like, even if you had a bad upbringing and a bad parenting and a bad anything, because we look to Jesus. God demonstrated his love towards us. And while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so we can look to Jesus and see what he's done for us. And that is the demonstration of love that you see hanging on a cross. I don't know about you, but anytime I see Jesus on a cross like depicted for real, it kind of disturbs me because I know I put him there. My sins put him there. And that is the cost of my freedom. That's the cost of your freedom. That's an explanation and a demonstration of God's love for you. In Romans verses eight, verse, uh, chapter 8, verses 35, 38, and 39, says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or the sword, or COVID-19? For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, or any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The scripture explains that there is nothing that will separate us from the love of God. It doesn't matter how far you go, how far you've slidden, how difficult you've made it for God to pursue you. He's with you and his love pursues you as well. That is the love of our God. Something far surpassing any love that anyone's ever experienced, seen or done, God has done for us. And so as we look at Jesus, we can see God's love for us. Romans 5, verses 7 to 9. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. You know, there are people that are good that you might take a bullet for uh, if they're righteous. But God demonstrates his own love toward us. And while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. In other words, if God loved you so much to come down in, in person, in the body of his son, and die for you, how much more does he love you now that you've accepted him? And how much more will you be preserved and saved now that you know him? which is a great and wonderful, mind-blowing sort of thing when you think about it. If God loved you before you obeyed him, how does he feel about now that you do? And about now that you've come into a relationship with him? 2 Corinthians 5, 20, 21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You see, God switched place with us and he came and took the punishment that we deserve so that we might have an eternity with him. What a tremendous privilege it is and how often we neglect 
the greatness of God's love and sometimes forget about it or think we need to earn it or try to perform in a way that we think we're impressing God to love us more. But he can't love us more than he already does because he loves us more than anything can measure. Verse 11, Behold, the beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. It's an interesting passage. If God loved us, we should love one another. If God, who's perfect and holy, can love us, we should love one another. I mean, how hard is it for you to love another sinner, a fellow sinner? It should be easy. You're a sinner. You're wicked to the core. And if God didn't come and save you, there'd be nothing left to redeem. And yet, we find it so difficult to forgive. We find it difficult to let things go, to you know, let people off the line, to, to forgive them and never mention their sins to them or anyone else ever again, never to even remember them. And when they do, you know, we put a bullet in it and put it in the ground. That's how we should love one another. And we should be thoughtful and caring and concerned for one another. And he's speaking to the church. He's talking about brethren, beloved. Those of us who are in a church who have brothers and sisters. And I don't know about you, but it tends to be that the enemies of a man will be of his own household, as Jesus said. So it, it tends to be the people that you're closer with. It becomes very difficult to love them with that agape love. A stranger? Boy, you know, I could, I could go over somebody else's house and fix their faucet while mine drips for years. Uh, that just tends to be the way that we're made. I don't know why. I'm still asking God to fix me about that. But we should be able to love each other. And if we can't, then that might be an indicator that you don't know God, that you don't have a relationship with him. Because if you can't love, then you, you certainly don't have it if it hasn't been given to you. But if it's been given to you, you should be able to give it away. So love does several things. It demonstrates, number one, that God lives in us. If you have love for somebody else, because everyone who loves is born of God and knows God, as we saw in verse 7. So when we love, it's proof to ourselves and to the rest of the world that we know God. Because there's no way that you could do that unless you knew God. That sacrificial, not the eros kind of love, which is about satisfying my desires and needs, but actually being self-sacrificing for someone else who doesn't deserve it, who hasn't earned it, who won't pay you back. That's the test of love. Number one, God lives in us. Number two, that he's in you. So when I see love in you coming towards me, that's a verification that you have a relationship with God or you wouldn't be able to do that. And so those in, in a like-minded fellowship, those in a church, should be loving one another. It, it's called the body of Christ after all. And so we should love one another because love is from God. Number three, it shows God's progressive work. If there's love inside of me, love is being matured in me. It's being grown in me. The fruit of the Spirit is coming out in me. And so you, you should see progressive maturity in a Christian. It's something that when God makes you new and you begin to learn to be like him and you have a heart like him and a mind like him and your, your actions begin to look like Jesus, that we're mature. And we're seen to be more like Jesus as we go. And that's something that assures us, force number, it assures our heart as we go before God. When you feel like you're a schmuck and you, you, you know, you're not very much and you're not high in the totem pole and you're not feeling full of God or close to God or any of that, you can remember that you have compassion and love towards other people and that's evidence that God is in your life. I don't know about you, but it, it comforts me very often when uh, I feel like I'm far away from God. He reminds me of things that I have done in, in, in the past, and it reminds me that, you know what, I, I have a power source that is other than my flesh. I have the Lord, and I know I can go to him for a refueling and to be bolstered up and encouraged so I can continue to do what he wants me to do. So those are the things that it demonstrates. In John chapter 15, verses 11 to 17, Jesus says this to his disciples. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love 
one another as I have loved you. So Jesus tells us to love, but he tells us how to love in the same way that he loved us. How did he love us? He died for us. Which means whenever there's a loving relationship, somebody has to die. If you want to show love, there has to be something that dies. Something of you. Greater love is no one than this, than he lays one's life down for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatever you ask the Father in my name that he may give you. These things I command you that you love one another. So Jesus said that we should love one another. And he said the amazing thing was, you didn't choose me, I chose you. And speaking to the disciples, that's exactly what happened. He went and chose 12. And of course, we know he chose Judas for a very specific purpose. But they were all chosen. But you're also chosen. God picked you and picked you all by yourself and not because of anything he was going to get out of you or how you would be all polished up like a diamond. He chose you because he loved you. That's an amazing thought. I find it very hard to recover from that or to get over that. God loved me, not for anything that's inside of me, not for anything that I could offer him, but because he wanted to show his love. And that is the greatest reason to love, isn't it? Unconditionally. Moving on, how can you grow in love? That's a really good question, right? How can you grow in love? Uh, as I look at the scriptures about love, I start to think my love is really very selfish. I tend to love people that love me back. I, you know, I get the phileo, the give and take thing. And eros, I understand that too. But the agape, which is to give and then get spat in the face or hung on a cross, that kind of love is very difficult for me. So how do you grow your heart in love? Is there a way to do that? And this might sound silly, but how about sharing a meal? Sharing a meal is a good way to express love, to show love, and have your heart grow. Uh, these are pictures of my wife. I take my wife out. We have a date night on Fridays, and uh, love language for her is food. And so I take her out for a meal, and that reassures her that I love her, believe it or not. A, a, a good steak says, I love you. Uh, or, uh, or some wonderful seafood says, I love you. It's, it's a physical demonstration of how I can show my wife that I love her. And so, how do you grow your heart in love? Well, give it away. Give it away, and how about sharing a meal? For instance, when uh, Jesus was separating, uh, as you can tell down here, uh, social distancing with the disciples at the Last Supper, and Michelangelo, and as he was on the Zoom call and celebrating the uh, Last Supper, Jesus, to show his love, demonstrated his love by having a meal. It was the Passover meal. And as he broke the bread and as he poured out the cup to his disciples, he said, this is my body, which is given for you for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you do this, do this in remembrance of me. He took the cup and he said, this is my blood given to you. Every time you do this, remember me. Drink all of it, he said to them. And so the way that he showed love to them was by having a meal with his disciples. So it's not uncommon for us to be able to do that for one another. He says here in John chapter 13, verses 12 to 17, the meal was not the only thing that Jesus did to show his love to his disciples. He did this after having the meal, which seems a little silly, but it says in verse 12 of John 13, so when he had washed their feet taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. 
So Jesus washed the disciples' feet, a job that the lowest slave in the house would do, a job that no one wanted to do, a job that was a bit embarrassing to have done to you by someone you call the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, that's exactly what happened. And he washed their feet. He comes to Peter, of course, and Peter says, you know, Lord, you're going to wash my feet? He says, well, Peter, you don't understand what I'm doing right now, but later on you will. And he goes, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. And he goes, well, if I don't wash your feet, then you have no part with me. And then Peter suddenly wanted, you know, a, a sponge bath from head to toe. And he says, you don't need that because you are clean by the word I've spoken to you, but not all of you are clean. He was referring to Judas Iscariot. Jesus washed their feet. And he says, do you, do you see what I've done for you? You call me Lord and Master, and so I am. If I wash your feet, you should wash one another's feet. So are you washing people's feet? Are you stooping down at the lowest level to remove the filth and the dirt from someone else who probably should be washing your feet, and yet they won't? And it's interesting, the Scripture doesn't say who washed Jesus' feet, because I'm not sure anyone did. But I think when we wash one another's feet, it's like washing the feet of Jesus. And we're ministering unto the Lord by doing that. So this love that we're commanded, this love that God demonstrated, this love that God continually affirms to our heart because he's given us his spirit, this love is something that God would have us do. So I would encourage you to enlarge your heart I would encourage you to take a meal with somebody or do whatever it takes to show love towards them. And I pray that you would do that soon. The passage we've gone over is 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 to 13. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He does not love, does not know God. For God is love. And in this, the love of God was manifest toward us that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation or the satisfaction for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time, if we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. I'm so glad to know the Lord Jesus Christ, and to be fueled by him to be able to love other people. And I would challenge you to put this at the forefront of your mind, to think about how you could show love towards other people. Even at a time when you might be separated from them, maybe a phone call, maybe being thoughtful of somebody else's burdens and taking care of it for them. There are people who have the gift of service who enjoy getting their hands dirty, washing other people's feet, you should do that. There are people who have the gift of giving, who want to give of their resources to those who don't. And if God's gifted you in that way, then by all means do that. There are people that God has gifted with the gift of encouragement to speak a word from God to encourage someone else. If God's called you to do that, you should do that. Or the gift of prophecy, where you speak on behalf of God to someone. There are so many things through the body of Christ and all of these gifts that God has given for us not to hoard them to ourselves, but to practice agape love. And so it's my prayer for you guys at maybe this difficult time in your life that you would show the love of God to other people, that it would be at the forefront of your mind, that you would understand that you have been sent by God. You've been saved by Him to go and love others. And certainly, it begins with those who are closest to us, those who are the beloved, those who are in the church, those who are in our family, those who we know and have contact with. So I would challenge you not to feel condemned about falling short, but that you might be inspired to reach higher and depend upon the Lord for the strength to be able to do that. 
It's my prayer that the Lord is keeping you safe and strong and that we might see each other soon. Be blessed in Christ. Amen.